Because I yeah. started imagining myself again in those rooms for 16 hours. Yeah. Seven days a week. Just imagine it and really think about whether that's where you want to go back to or whether that's just some romanticized idea that you have mm -hmm. about what that job is. Today, I'm really, really excited to share my chat with composer and content creator Anne Catherine Dern. This is an interview and discussion that I'd been meaning to have for a really long time with her. She does some amazing videos on her YouTube channel and she's an incredible composer, so I highly recommend you check her stuff out. So one of the questions, I have a couple, but it seems like maybe this is one that would be relevant right now would be how many projects are you doing at one time usually? <laughs> well, I try to only do one, mm -hmm. because, you know, then it's more relaxed and I get to, you know, really spend time with it. But that's kind of never how it turns out, unfortunately. Um, like a movie I'm on right now that I've been on since like mid December is actually dragging out until like June you know mm -hmm. but i also have another spotting session next week for another movie but i'm also on two video games and oh, they have different running time like one of them is a really small thing that is just like a three-week thing and then similar to the movie that i have coming up that one's also just like a three-week thing um but then i'm also on a larger video game that's gonna run from march till like october or something so it's all kind of overlapping yeah i have other things coming up later in fall and so it's it's always like i don't want it to happen like that but it always ends up happening like that yeah i get it i feel like it's 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 uh feast or famine, right? Like it's either you get a ton of stuff all at once or you get like a complete dry spell for like two weeks yeah i mean sometimes even longer sometimes you know things get delayed and i wait for a whole month and i'm like well i guess i'm just gonna you know chill for a month yeah and then it's insanity for three months and then it's kind of chill where i just have one thing going on at the same time then all of a sudden i have four things going on again and it's like... yeah so do you ever in those situations do you set uh an upper limit for yourself to limit work or is it more a matter of like how can i outsource this or get additional help so that I can I can tackle what's been asked of me. Um, I do have kind of a limit in where um, first of all, obviously, I want to be really involved in the projects that I find creatively interesting. Like I don't want to give that away because that's the fun for me. Right. Um, but also with every project, I want to still be involved on like 70 75 percent of the work. I mean, on one hand, I can't even really step away to begin with because I need to manage everybody I hire, um, give feedback and, you know, all that stuff. But yeah, I'm like, if I can't do at least, I don't know, 70% of the stuff myself, then, you know, I probably wouldn't take the gig. I just turned down a movie, actually, that would have happened in April because I'm like, I'm going to be on the bigger video game during that time and I'm going to be on a fairly big movie at that time and those need my attention because both of them are creatively important to me mm -hmm. and I want to do most of the work on them um, and they also require me to travel and all that stuff so you know if I'm going back and forth between Europe and LA it's like no yeah. i can't manage a team and then you know not really participate in in those gigs so right yeah do you travel a lot for your work not over the past couple of years because pandemic well but... true <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the budgets like some of these productions will you know fly me around and then others obviously won't yeah um, but yeah, if I'm required to be somewhere in Belgium or Austria or Germany or wherever, UK, and the production is like, we want you there, we'll buy you a ticket, then, you know, sure, yeah. I'll, I'll go. <laughs> is that, yeah, it's true. You get the free trip. Is, and is that generally for um, like sessions, like getting recordings done, or is it for spotting or kind of combination? Spotting, not really, because that's not really important enough to yeah. fly, right. <laughs> fly you out. <laughs> we can do that on Zoom. Yeah. Um, but it's usually for sessions, especially if I'm conducting as well, um, then I kind of have to be there. Mm -hmm. But it's also for mixes. 
especially if the music mix and then the dub mix are happening kind of in the same um, region around the same time, then they're just like, why don't we just book you to be here for like two weeks so you can supervise the music mix and then also the week after come over into the dub stage and kind of give notes yeah in there so that happened um there's also one or two opportunities where they fly me over for teaching for giving guest lectures and stuff later this year i'll be at the hollywood music workshop in oh cool august yeah i'll i'll give a three-day workshop so that's gonna be another work trip um yeah that's that's usually it and then sometimes for premieres but not often mm -hmm. do you find the teaching to be a nice outlet from like the composing and other work that you're doing yeah it's not something i would want to do full time um sure i prefer like the master class format very much um like i wouldn't want private students or you know one-on-one -on -one type stuff I'm yeah more of a I will give you an overview over this concept and then you can ask questions and then I leave and do my composing <laughs> then work. move on. Right. Yeah. I totally <laughs> and get I move that. on with my life. <laughs> yep. I think lessons are tough too, because it's like, I used to do, I mean, back when even my pricing was lower, I think that, you know, the kind of students that you get, you, it's just a, like a really wide gamut of people. Like there's people who are really just getting started and want, literally like anything from piano lessons to like how do i you know what are the shortcuts in a daw but then i noticed that some of my students as i charge more but also probably the audience that that i'm starting to attract it's more like career advice it's almost like consultation as opposed to like reviewing music or teaching harmony or something like that too so i i kind of resonate I, I sort of enjoy teaching more on a broader because i i've always felt like that musical skills there's obviously resources out there, but a lot of it comes down to like an individual and kind of what they gravitate towards. So it's hard to, I don't know. I feel like someone's time is almost worth more when you actually chat about broader subjects like career. Well, and I also, I don't know. I get a lot of people asking me for very specific career advice and I'm like, I don't know. I, yeah. how would I be able to tell you what to do? I like, because it's so much depends on the person's personality and music style, where they live, are they able yeah. to move, are they able to travel, you know, what's their financial situation that plays a big role in sure. particularly freelance industry, you know, what can you afford, what can you not afford, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, there's so many factors, like, do they have, you know, children to take care of, or are they, you know, single and kind of free to move around? and you know use their time as they see fit like there's so many factors that play into what the best path is for a person right the same way people ask me you know what college and i'm like that is so dependent <laughs> on who you are what learning yeah. method you want what teachers you vibe with also maybe college isn't even for you maybe you thrive in a completely different setting so, you know, I'm like, I can't give advice on any of this because it's so personal. Yeah, I had a, I have a good friend who told me that sometimes I don't think people realize it because I used to do the same thing. But I, I think that sometimes people are almost looking for a direct answer because they want just a, a shortcut to get to the route. Like it's really in some ways, it's probably a compliment because it's saying I really admire where you're at or what you're accomplishing, or I would like, I enjoy your music and how do I get there? <laughs> you know, but, but you're right. I think it's, what's difficult about it is it's so, it's such a unique thing, especially in this industry, because uh, yeah, like you said, everybody comes from different walks of life, has different needs, which has been something that's been illuminating even for me too, is that some people really enjoy you know, exclusively composing and some people like I, this is sort of where I sit. I love composing, but I do recognize I have an upper limit with how much I can do and things like YouTube actually kind of offset that for me, you know, which I was going to ask you too, uh, with regards to YouTube, was that something you started with intentions of finding more work or was it an outlet for you or what, what kind of motivated you to do YouTube? It was more of an outlet for me. I mean, it has led to work, surprisingly. Yeah. <laughs> but that wasn't really the, that wasn't the goal of it. It was more like, um, 
I mean, you know, I'm part of the teammates community on Discord and no longer on Facebook, but they are still on Facebook. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I'm not on Facebook anymore. <laughs> I, get out and run. <laughs> I got out of that. Yep. <laughs> like an abusive relationship. <laughs> Don't blame you at all. I use the forums and that's it. I unfriended and like unfollowed everybody on my list. <laughs> yeah. I see. I just at some point I just took my money and ran. I was You're like, like I'm, I'm out. out. Yeah, I'm out. less distractions. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did join Twitter instead, and so I don't know if that's better. But <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole different can of worms. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I don't take Twitter so seriously, so it's just like. Yeah, you know, that's. Yeah. I think that's what it is. Yeah, it's just having the the ability to turn it off and walk away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but so yeah anyway i i started that as a like i did a mock-up walkthrough um and that's kind of how it started and i had been giving guest lectures before where people were like oh man like all this stuff that you're teaching like how to do session prep and pro tools and how to deliver stems and all this stuff nobody teaches that to us at film scoring programs and i was like well that is shameful yeah and yeah. so people were like, man, I wish you have like you'd have an online course or something. And, you know, I didn't really have the time to create something like that. I still don't. Mm -hmm. um, but I was like, well, if it's just like individual videos, whenever I have time, I guess I could do that in my free time, especially because also there were no women in that space to begin with. So I was right. like, well, someone's got to do it. So yeah. might as well be me. Um, and yeah just kind of giving back to the community and also kind of as a way to um not have to train new people all the time because now if i get right. a new team member i can just be like hey i need you to do proto session prep here's a video where i explain that yeah i do the same <laughs> let me, thing <laughs> let me know if you have any questions after yep. <laughs> and usually they don't i just had someone do proto session prep for the first time and they sent a session to me and were like, can you just double check that I did this right? I watched your video and just kind of, and I checked it and everything was perfect. And I was like, great, keep doing it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. I agree. It's, and it's interesting, it came from a place of, of an outlet because that was, that was true for me too. And I almost wonder sometimes if that's what makes it, I mean, I'm assuming you feel that it's sustainable for you. I know that you have a busy schedule, so I'm sure sometimes it feels tough to, get it but it sounds like your balance with it is somewhat relaxed it, it is i mean i do get like the the um algorithm anxiety you know when i yeah. notice you know things are going down and i know how Eight to of start 10. It. yeah <laughs> i know how to start it back up because i now have enough content over a long period of time and enough viewers to know what's resonating with people and what format mm -hmm. they like, what content they like. So I know what to make, but the problem is the stuff that they like the most is incredibly hard to make because it's the stuff yeah. where I'm like, here's a primer on counterpoint. Like you can't just do that in five yeah. minutes, you know? Right. I have to like open my old college textbooks and be like, okay, let me just read up on that myself first so I don't actually say anything wrong. Yeah. Or like, here's a primer on the orchestral instruments. And then I sit there with, you know, study of orchestration going through it and just making sure that what I say is actually accurate. Yeah. Um, or the composition videos, like here's a composition technique, but then I have to create examples and all this stuff and really, you know, so yeah. those are the ones that take forever to make, but those are the ones that get the most engagement that gain me the most traction yeah so i'm like i'm happy to make those videos but they do take time and i feel really guilty because i think the last real composition video that i published was like in november <laughs> i mean there's people who don't upload for a year I, I i've done like my one a week schedule just for myself but i also sometimes question it too because i think that i'm starting to shift into this mindset where it's like better to make fewer videos that are I feel are really of substance than just stick to a schedule just because that's the schedule because otherwise it's I mean it's sort of waste both people's time I'm, I'm sure every video I do has some value to somebody but if I could consolidate that energy into you know even if it's one video a month or even one video every two months or something it's still it gives me an ability to really focus the energy in a way yeah, similar to composition probably in terms of like having a really busy schedule versus being able to kind of zoom in and 
you know, hone one project. Yeah. But I mean, for me, it's just that, you know, I'm falling behind a little on the YouTube stuff just because my main income is from composition and from sure. royalties from those compositions. So, um, you know, that's like over 90% of my income and the rest is like me giving guest lectures or doing YouTube, buy me a yeah. coffee, like all that stuff. Um, so this really only accounts for a really small portion of my income. Like if this fell away, it would not really have a yeah. massive impact on me. Um, so the pressure, the financial pressure isn't really there. That's nice. Right. Um, but it also means that I do have to prioritize my real work. And mm -hmm. that means I just can't post as much as I would like. I have a bunch of videos scripted out. I might record them actually this week. Someone reached out to me and was like, are you okay? We haven't heard from you in a while. And I'm I like, know people do <laughs> that. Yeah. I used to run a, a, a duet channel with a friend of mine and we decided to move on and stop. We're still great friends, but we just, with our schedules. And like you said, I mean, so much, we would spend a week on arrangements, making sheet music, making an intro. I mean, it was just absurd. And then you'd get like, you know, 200 bucks if even. And yeah. so we stopped. And it's been like two years and all the comments now are like, what happened to these guys? Like just do Google search. We're still, we're, we're good. We're all right. It also doesn't help that I was really sick in November. Like I had this really long, I don't know what it was. It wasn't COVID. It was this other one that lasts forever. Um, oh, that's been going around. And so I just couldn't record anything for three weeks and I didn't have a voice and then I had to catch up on work and then it was Christmas and you know, yeah, yeah. things happen. But so people are now like, you said you were sick then. Are you really <laughs> sick? And I'm like, I'm not dying. It's fine. I'm, I'm okay. I just, <laughs> right. All good. <laughs> life is just in the way right now, but yeah. I am scripting videos and I, I have a couple scripts to go ready and I've already prepped the material for them. I just have to, you know, get all dolled up and do my camera setup, and then I'll I'll record them and edit them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think that you, uh, my friend Mattia, I, you probably maybe you know Mattia too, Kiapa. No. Oh, he's really great. Oh if, wait, I do, I do. Yeah, yes. he's an amazing orchestrator and composer, and uh, but he just, man, he puts so much effort into his videos, and like I admire that so much. But I'm also so much lazier when it comes to the YouTube part. Like for me, I, I don't know. I don't think I'm the same with composing actually, but with YouTube, maybe in the back of my head, knowing either the revenue difference or just the amount of time, I, I usually turn on a camera and, <laughs> and go if usually if I have a specific idea of what I want to do, I just kind of run with it. And then I probably spend more of my time in post, I would say, like editing or kind of trimming whatever I think needs to be done to make it a salvageable video. But I totally get it if you're scripting out something and you have to plan and it's that video is going to have so much long term value, I think, because of the work that goes into it. But it's a ton of work. Well, that and it's also it's turned into great promotion because I also do these behind the scenes videos, which are the most work. Yeah, oh God. I love Especially them. Though. When there's yeah. session footage, multicam footage, all that editing, and then getting footage from 10 different people. And I always offer to the whole team to be in the video if they want to. And then if too many people say yeah. yes, I'm just like, oh my God. I love that you nightmare. do that, by the way. That's, it's so cool to see that on, on so many levels. Like that's, I really admire you doing that and, and also getting your, your team involved in that. I think it's super, super cool and a really cool precedent for people. Yeah, I think, you know, that was another thing. I mean, I love the creative freedom I have on the channel because usually we don't have that with work for hire. With mm -hmm. the channel, I can just do whatever I want. Um, but also those videos, I can make however I want them and I can make my team visible, you know, and I, yep. it's just my choice. And then I send that to my agent and I'm like, here, if you know someone who'd be interested in that. And then she sends it to like select executives and stuff. And it's ah, like, brilliant. Hey, look at that thing she just did. And then they yeah. can also the executives probably know my team by now as well, because they must yeah. have seen the videos. They're like, yeah, we know that that person. <laughs> but I think it works. I think it works for both parties, too, because then there's a level of I, I think you have more experience in this than me, but do you feel that maybe sometimes it's the fact that 
people aren't spoken about that sort of makes it like an elephant in the room. So then as they hit a point with working some with someone, if they haven't made it known that they're they've got a team, then it's almost like you this this feeling that you have to keep it up, keep up the mask as opposed to just being like establishing early. I work with a team. Yeah, if they're not upfront about it, it's kind of hard to introduce later down the line, I think, mm -hmm. because, you know, they don't want the client to think that they've been lying this whole time when technically they have been, but okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want them By to By the know way. That. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we were deceptive and committed fraud <laughs> according to our contract. <laughs> hey, no mind. <laughs> um yeah, I, I think we just need to normalize the fact that most composers will have some form of team, whether that's additional writers or, you know, orchestrators or copyists and contractors and managers and admin assistants and other mm -hmm. other people that help us. Like on the last one, we had like a synth designer. You know, I wouldn't want people to think that I designed all of those sounds. I made some of them, but right. not all of not nearly all of them, you know, that was someone else who came in and was like, let me make some zebra patches. Yeah. And I feel like I, you know, that needs to be showcased that, you know, th there's other people behind this, you know, that, that I don't always do my own orchestrations. Like I do the mock-ups and they're very, very detailed, but then my orchestrator comes in and he, you know, changes things a little or makes things work in a way that you know they wouldn't have worked in a real life setting and i would probably know that but it's not something i need to concern myself with and very often he will put in so much stuff into the scores that i've never even heard of like very <laughs> specific descriptors and words and phrasing or um you know all kinds of stuff where i look at the score and i'm like i don't even know what that means but you know, yeah I have, I have to like start googling things and i'm like what does that word even <laughs> <laughs> but i mean but it does i think that working with a team ultimately enhances the value and the quality of something and i think that maybe part of the part of the issue is that there's so much emphasis placed on like the genius individual artist that artists maybe feel pressure to maintain that but ultimately you know we're the the way I see it is we're the creative head of this machine and the more the more time that is divided with us doing a lot of the you know every aspect of every piece of the work the less time we can devote to actually being on top of it and seeing the big picture and being able to delegate and manage the project itself well and I think the thing for me is, you know, the themes will still come from me, you know, I right. do these theme suites or like individual theme pieces that I, you know, that's where I collaborate with the filmmakers. I'm like, is this what you want? And, you know, that's where I'm really hands on. And then e even after that, like I said, I still want, you know, a solid like around 70% or so of the score to come f directly from me. Um, but so anybody who works with me um, gets those themes and they derive their ideas from those themes and spin them further and do other stuff with it. Sometimes stuff yeah. that I wouldn't even have thought of. I, I sometimes listen to my additional writers and I'm like, oh, I never thought about doing that with the theme. Because yeah. I heard it a certain way in my head and did it a certain way. And that's now how it's, you know, set in stone in my mind. Yeah. But they when they hear it, they hear a completely different thing. So, of course, right. You know, it's also just fun for me to just see what what other people would do with my material and to just kind of be like, oh, yeah. And then there are also scenes where I'm just not inspired or where I watch a scene and I'm like, I kind of don't know what to do here. And then sometimes one of my additional writers is like, I know exactly what to do here. Give me that scene. Yeah. And I'm like, go for it. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even, it didn't occur to me the idea of, yeah, you just delegate it because you're kind of, if you're at a creative block and there's no time, it's just like, I need someone to have an idea for this. Yeah, it makes yeah, sense. I mean, why not? I already know at the spotting session, which scenes I want to do anyway, you know, usually it's all the big stuff, all the exposed stuff, you know, yeah. all the big emotional beats and all that stuff but there are also scenes where i'm just like i don't have an initial idea for this so mm -hmm. this might be just 
something someone else can do while I focus on the bigger picture stuff. Is there a uh, specific scene type or mood that you really don't like scoring? Oh God, comedy. Comedy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so hard. Why is it so hard? Because yeah. I always, I never want to do the like pizzicato string, you know, the plucky, yeah. you know? I know. I, and it gets tougher to when the deadline's it. tight too. Then it's like, yeah. that would work. <laughs> yeah. Every time I sit there and I'm like, this would work, but I kind of just don't want to do this cliche. And then yeah. I want to be creative with the comedy. And then if nothing comes up, I'm struggling so yeah. much. Also, because the comedy, it's like, how do you attack the comedy? Do you do you play into the fact that it's intending to be funny? Are you playing against it and trying to be totally serious yeah. about it to make it fun? You know? It's tough. Yeah. I've done a lot of comedy stuff and I find it really it's plus humor is so unique to each project too, that I find that it's really hard to just apply one strategy on everything. Cause it's really different. I find it usually easier in animation because in animation, it's often physical comedy that you're just kind of Mickey mousing in a way. Yeah. But in live action comedy, I sometimes find it so hard because it's so easy to overdo it and ruin the comedy. So yeah. for me, this whole pulling back and really pausing to me, that's the the main key. And that I learned from one of my additional writers, like he's really good at comedy and he knows when to pause the music. And I'm like, oh, that's hmm. so brilliant. Like just like, in other hesitating. words, like a sort of dramatic pause or, or just, just give it a beat. Give it a beat or, you know, just kind of, just the little nuances, like little thing, pausing on a look and then coming back in and, you mm. know, just sometimes just a little trill and a little shaker and a little, you know, he's yeah. so good at just doing tiny things that shape the whole scene. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's something I <laughs> struggle with. <laughs> I struggle with, with silences and music in general. So that's, that's actually a really good tip too. Cause I, I find that for me, I do mostly animation, which I, I really enjoy. I find it really challenging, even though I enjoy it. Uh, but I, I, you know, with the amount of transitions that you have to cover, it's really tough to write a piece of music. I've in some of the live action I've done, I've noticed you can sort of get a get the ball rolling with a cue and sort of follow yeah. it through and you don't have to be so locked. But in animation, it could be like 10 seconds and then it's like, you don't hit this. You're just going to feel like you're separating from the animation a bit. Um, but I've noticed that using silences or just even holding a note really, really helps because it just gives you that room to not make it feel like it's cue time. And it's more like you can just kind of give accents or just nods or gestures here and there. Well, I think the reason I struggle with those exact things is because those are usually cues I give away to my additional writers. <laughs> so I have insane amount of practice doing big action cues, big yeah. adventure stuff, big choir stuff, the big opening, closing, the big emotional thing. Right. And then over the past two years or so, I was like, you know what? I should assign myself a lot of the smaller cues as well because I struggle with this mm. stuff too much because I never do these cues. And yeah. now, you know, other people have, you know, so much practice with that and I don't. So I, I have tough. to force myself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I uh, have been doing additional for um, uh, Kung Fu Panda, the Dragon Knight, uh, which mm -hmm. has been a blast. I've really enjoyed it. Um, do, you, do you know Bob Lidecker? Yes. I mean, yeah, not he's, personally. But yeah, he, I met him actually because he and I went to the same high school, like, many years ago, but he was a couple grades above me. I never met him, but uh, he was the first person I met when I, I came out here and uh, he he let me do additional on this, which has been fun. But what was a real wake up call for me was like the first few cues he gave me would be like one minute cues somewhere in the middle of the animation, you know? And so I would I would watch it and be like, okay, I've got an idea of what I would do. And I would score it like it was a minute cue like a real cue and then i would finish it and i would look like two minutes forward and realize i was at like you know 10 percent of this 100 percent action cue and i had just done this and i yeah. was like oh man so so yeah i know what you mean it's like 
finding the restraint to rec- recognizing like where you are in the arc of the story too, I think is, is really important and probably tricky doing additional because you kind of get dropped in sometimes, you yeah. know? So yeah, I, uh, I feel you there. I don't love action though. I, I would be curious really? if you have action. I think I just struggle with it. I tend to like over layer and I also am not a great, I struggle with percussion a lot. I, I, I like okay. doing stuff without percussion. And sometimes I feel like my music probably doesn't even need percussion, but I'll put it in because I think it's supposed to be there. <laughs> Do you have strategies you approach with action music? Yeah, don't use percussion. <laughs> oh, there you go. All right, fair enough. <laughs> Unless it's like, um, like on the last movie that I had come out, there was, it was an action thriller kind of thing, very modern. So we had to have like big drums and stuff. But on animation, for example, I always write all of my cues without percussion first. And then I really go in and add percussion last because, um, looking at other animated music usually the driving factor is not coming from the percussion it's coming from the rest of the orchestra so yeah for me the cue has to work without percussion first so that's mm-hmm. the last thing i do um and then i mean you know if you have themes basically just putting the themes over an ostinato is already gonna get you halfway there <laughs> <Right>. i mean <laughs> so use percussion more as like accents to what's going on orchestrally as opposed to the 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 motor yeah Correct. Yep. Um, that's kind of, and I kind of stick to the, if you look at a lot of John Williams, to me, that's kind of a really effective way of scoring. Cause usually there's only three elements going on, you know, right. There's like some kind of baseline going on. There's some kind of ostinato going on. And then there's a theme being played on top of it. And then he just modulates or does these little, you know, planing throw-ins and stuff. And, you know, just, you know, goes other places or shifts the rhythm or meter. Right. I do that a lot too, just meter shifting. Me too. Yeah. I used to be super locked to tempo. I would just be adjusting tempo every time. And the the more I've done it, the more I'm like, yeah, it doesn't, as long as you're falling slightly late of something, you're usually, you usually have a lot of wiggle room as to when you're going to land because it's as long as you don't land it before something happens, yeah. you know? Um, See, this is yeah. also why I like action cues, because usually if you write them in like tempo 150, you're always going to land on some beat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's kind of what I've been doing, too. It's like, I'm, I think 160. But I do sometimes notice that my, I have to be careful when I'm at that tempo, because I sometimes it'll come off as manic to me, which probably mm-hmm. is more to do with subdividing as opposed to like using that as an overarching, like, cause you could do 160 and treat it like 80. Yeah. You know? So I, I noticed that too, but, but I do, I speaking about the percussion, I know what you mean because there's a couple cues I've done that I didn't use percussion first. And I, I actually had a lot more fun writing it too. Cause I could focus on what felt like the, the musical core for me. So, yeah. Yeah, I I agree. Well, and also for me, something that always works is just writing in 7-8 or 5-8. And especially at a rapid tempo, nobody's going to know if you sneak in a different kind of meter in there, you know, Mm because everybody's confused about that thing anyway. So (laughs) nobody (laughs) knows. So it's so easy to land on stuff with that kind of thing going on. So yeah, yeah. And do you score when you do these like larger action sequence, do you go sequentially or do you map things out? Like what's your process like with a longer queue in terms of how you approach it? Uh, I, I map it out first. I do a piano sketch first with oh, the okay. themes and the motor and the bass line and like the elements have to be there. And then I think about orchestration and you know, what I'm going to add and all this stuff, but mm-hmm. yeah, I don't just <laughs> write it. Just go. Um, <laughs> That's me. <laughs> it's too many choices. Like my yeah. brain just gets, over, gets fatigued really fast because I'm trying to make a hundred choices per second. And then I'm yeah. just like, I get tired really quick. So this way I just kind of minimize the amount of choices I have to make. So the first choice is tempo map. How do I land on all this stuff? Then those choices are already out of the way. Then I make the make a piano track or multiple piano tracks and just sketch out the cue, sketch out the theme, where do the themes go? Sometimes I even just 
like draw in a line and just put the theme fragments where they need to be mm, and then i yeah. connect them you know and find the ostinato that works find you know the the right movement that works with each sequence and you know see if there are parts where i want to modulate to something else but those are all decisions i make and then i think about okay who's going to play what and yeah. then at the very, very end, after all that is said and done, I add the percussion and fancy little flourishes and stuff like that that, yeah. you know, I would not necessarily put in at the beginning because I can't deal with all those choices at once. That's just, mm -hmm. I, I can't. <laughs> do you find that takes, does that take self-restraint from you or do you prefer that, that approach? Because for me, when I go for that approach, it feels for me like a lot of self-restraint because the first thing I want to do is just like go is just go in and start writing something especially on a tight deadline where it's like we need this in two days I think the instinct is like start writing but I also noticed that taking a little time I don't necessarily do the piano sketches because one of the one of the challenges I have I'm a pianist myself and I probably over sketch sometimes so I'm putting in too much stuff and then it doesn't always translate to orchestra the way I want it to. So I noticed like right. broad brush strokes with piano sketches tend to help me more, but. Oh yeah. 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 I don't know it's, if that's the same for you, but. For me it's um, yeah. If it's uh, you know, even if it's just putting in an ostinato and the melodies and the bass, um, I just put them on different tracks because then I can also easily copy paste it into whatever instruments. I kind yeah. of treat it like a short score, basically. Mm -hmm. um, just getting like the different elements on like three to five different lines and then just copying them into whatever instruments need them. Um, so when the sketch is done, it's really done. You know, the yeah. cue is essentially the writing is done. Now I just need to copy paste, you know, all the bass notes into the basses and celli and octaves and, you know, right. do, do my orchestration thing. But so then it's it becomes a question of just who's going to play what. Yeah. Um, and, you know, making it sound good. But to me, it's just a peace of mind kind of question, because once the sketch is done and interestingly, sketching takes me the least amount of time, but it mm. takes a lot of energy for me because it requires yeah. the actual writing part. Um, so I do that in like the first two hours of my day. And then I'm like, okay, now I can chill. Now I can take a walk, get some breakfast, make me a coffee. Because now all that's left to do is basically doing the mock-up from the sketch. All the right. voice leading is already correct. I already, you know, did the, like, if I know something's going to be played by strings, I already do string voicings in the piano. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. don't even have to deal with that anymore. You know, I, you kind of already know while you're sketching it, who's going to play where, what, where it's but, going. Right. You know? So, yeah. And also yeah. probably makes it, I feel like ultimately it's a really useful practice, even in terms of delegating. Cause I did have to do that specifically a handful of times when I knew I wanted to outsource like a mock-up portion of it. And yeah. I remember it was like a very like kind of lush Mancini-esque string arrangement. And what was really fun about that process was I got a chance to really just shut off the mock-up brain and just go straight into envisioning, you know, like you said, voice leading, counterpoint, and who's going yeah. where. And it was, um, I think the music actually came out way better in that regard because it's separating your tasks a little bit, you know? So I, I imagine that also if you're, I don't know if you ever outsource like the mock-ups from a sketch in your process, but. No, I've done the opposite though. This is actually where I learned it from uh, Ryan Shore. So mm. he, he learned under his uncle, Howard Shore, and he is still doing. <laughs> thought of Shore sounded familiar. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing the pen and paper thing. But so Ryan kind of does a similar thing, but he does the short score in the DAW with piano tracks. And then I would be doing mock-ups for him. Um, this was years ago, mm -hmm. but I saw that workflow and I was like, this is really smart because this way you get to just sit with the essence of the music and you get to see the different elements of the music and really think about harmonies. Like I don't naturally think of using a German five, six chord or something, you know? Sure. But if I just see the bare piano sketch, I'm like, 
hmm, maybe here instead of a secondary dominant, I could use a German 5 6 chord. Mm, you know, I see, like, yeah. because I can just see the essence. I, if I was already orchestrating, I would never think of that or like, you know, holding a note a little longer because I can see in the piano roll where it's going to resolve. You know, again, yeah. not something I would naturally come up with if I already had the full orchestra thing going. Yeah. And it's so overwhelming to try these things out because then you also have to like change the whole mock-up. Yep. Like, yeah. Changing one tiny thing is like, oh, I, I want to try out how this chord would work if it was like this. Yeah. You know? Is a huge effort if you already did the full mock-up. You know, yeah, whereas that's... in a piano sketch, so easy to just try something out and be like, eh, I hate that. Let's not do it. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's where that's I tend to do vertically. That's just like my default. But I noticed that the it's my promise with myself is, OK, if if you need to go vertically or that's just the way you want to work, you have to be really, really good at knowing when something's not working really early. Because yeah. <laughs> what I would used to do is overcommit, you know, I would commit to an idea and say, yeah, but this is a cool orchestration it's going to work. And then I get through the end and that realization is like slowly bubbling up. That's like, it's not working. And so now it's more a matter of like within two minutes, if something's not working, I'm just going to delete it. And I just, I'll just yeah. start over because I would rather make that decision early than be stuck with that decision, yeah. you know, after hours of work. Yeah, the same thing used to happen to me where I would commit to something and I would not want to delete it because the mock-up was so much work, you know? Right, I'm right. Like, I did all that work. I just want to... Some um, cost bias, I think they, I think it's called? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, this is also why I like keeping it in piano sketches first because you don't know kind of instantly if it's going to work or not because yeah. you, can, you can hear the sketch and see the picture, but also in your mind, you can already kind of hear it orchestrated. Mm -hmm. And like, it could be something as simple as like, the tempo isn't working. Yeah. I had this like where I would score an action scene and it would, you know, seem great. And then later on, I noticed the overall tempo was too slow. And it just didn't have the, I would have noticed that in a piano sketch instantly. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's you're, you're making me want to try this again. <laughs> because I had I committed my I was like, yeah, it doesn't work for me. But, but I, I agree. I think I guess there's different pros and cons for me to either the the challenge that I had with the piano sketch is being able to realize it in orchestration. And also, I think one thing that's tricky for me is I find that sometimes the orchestra, maybe this is just like me lacking with inner ear, but a specific orchestral color actually inspires me sometimes. So like literally hearing a flute sometimes inspires lines. And like, maybe because I grew up with piano, piano feels like literally black and white in some ways. Uh, but, but at the same time, I also, when a good piece of music is running, it's when I'm writing something that's a good piece of music, I'm usually thinking of it the same way as if I was doing a piano sketch. So it probably just comes down to like, maybe letting your ear run the show as opposed to letting your hands, if you're doing a piano sketch. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I use the pencil tool a lot to fix my piano sketches. Yeah. Especially sometimes I will try something out, especially later on when I'm, you know, in the mock-up phase and I distinctly thought I was going to have this melody in the flute and then I hear it in the flute and I'm like, I don't like this. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> you know, and then I'll just put it somewhere else. But that's kind of decisions I make in the mock-up phase. But at that point, I'm so relaxed because the composition is already there. It's really just True. about deciding oh, who's going to play the this instrument? And then sometimes I thought something would be a string arrangement and it ended up being, I actually left it in piano because it sounded better it in works. piano and just, you know, having a soloist with it or some pad. You know, sometimes I make random choices as well where I'm like, you know what, instead of this being a string pad as I thought initially, this might be cool as a synth pad. Mm. You know, just yeah. stuff like that. But this is stuff where I'm in the mock-up phase where I'm just trying things out if my initial idea that I had when I was sketching it out just isn't sounding the way I thought it would sound or where I'm just inspired to try something else but the yeah. nice thing is trying something else is such a quick thing to do when the composition is already there <laughs> just color choices at that point yeah you're just yeah. adjusting your color as opposed to this whole cue doesn't work <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs>
I wanted to ask you too, while we have a couple minutes left, um, probably selfish question, but because a lot of my composing these days has been kind of a mix of independent client work and assistant work, which I'm gradually shifting out of the assistant work. I was curious for you, I mean, do you do any assistant work still or you do do exclusively working with your clients? I don't do assistant work anymore. I think the last time I've done it was 2017. Oh, wow. Okay. So you've been doing, you've been out of that for a while, which. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> was that, what was that process of, of leaving that like for you? Was it a, I'm quitting cold Turkey or was it a, you shifted out of it? No, I slowly shifted out of it because for me, finances were a consistent issue until mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. So especially in LA, it's expensive here. Yeah, <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> it ain't cheap in Southern nope. California. <laughs> um, and so I couldn't just quit cold turkey because I would have been homeless. Um, yeah. And I was already without health care. So I was like, yeah, no, let's not, let's not tempt the gods. <laughs> not a good here. idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, that was one thing where I was like, you know, I was glad to have the assistant work that I had, and then it shifted more into additional writing. Mm -hmm. um, and then the moment I could really make enough money from additional writing, I kind of just started phasing out the assistant stuff and was just like, especially like the tech assistant stuff. I got into that because I worked at Cine Samples, and so right. a lot of studios would hire me to make their updates and, you know, update their templates and run their sample library updates, install new stuff. Yeah. You know, things like that, which all that fun stuff, <laughs> you know, great stuff to make an extra buck on the side, but not necessarily what I wanted to be creatively doing. fulfilling. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's nice to see other people set up and learn from it for your own setup. That's kind sure. Of how yeah. I saw it. But yeah, at the end of the day, that was just, you know, I have to make money. Um, but so the moment I could recommend other people for that stuff, I would just do that. Um, and then I've also been scoring my own short films and, you know, building up filmmaker relationships on the side. So at some mm -hmm. point it just naturally happened that some of those filmmakers started to make bigger things and would hire me for that. And then other times it was also composers that I had been doing additional music and mock-ups for were like, hey, I can't take this thing. It's too small for me. I don't have time. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do it? Yeah. Um, so it was kind of a combination of those things. And then I slowly started to phase out the mock-up stuff and slowly started to phase out the additional writing stuff. Um, so it was really a, a gradual process of, okay, I'm now making enough money here so I don't have to do this anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's been similar in my process too. I used to do a lot of copyist work in around 2018. And actually at the time I really enjoyed it, uh, yeah. which scared me <laughs> because I was like, this could be a rabbit hole and the pay can be really good with those projects too. Uh, but it was just becoming a bit of a time vacuum. And eventually I think you only have, well, you only have so much time to choose what you're gonna do. And so then I, you know, I was, I was mostly sticking to composing and mock-ups, which is similar to what I do now, but even now mock-ups are starting to phase out too. And now I'm, I think I'm starting to hit that point with the composing. I, I feel very fortunate because I didn't really do a traditional, any traditional assistant work. I, I've never worked with anyone full-time. It's always been part-time and, and most of it really was, has just been like additional music and composing which I sort of attribute that to my YouTube channel a bit. I think it's been a really helpful thing. But the realization I've also had recently is that, you know, the assistant work is can be really great, but building your own client base is something that, that does require effort and time as well. And from my perspective, you sort of need time to do both Otherwise, I wonder maybe people can get stuck in the assistant jobs because it pays well and it takes a lot of time. Well, does it pay well? Well, I guess that's, that's, yeah, that's true. That's, I guess it depends. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, I think I've worked with good people. So that's, that's yeah, it's true. There's... Some of them pay well. Yeah. And those are usually the ones where the assistants also stick around for like a decade and actually yeah. do that. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've seen some people get stuck in that people who wanted to be composers and 
kind of got stuck in the assistant route because yeah it paid well and then you know they started a family and they needed the income and the healthcare and you know all yeah. that stuff so they made choices um but yeah there's there's also a lot of people who le that leave that and are just like look if i stay here too long i'm going to be just known as this person's assistant yeah you know so. yeah and people i guess values are different too so you know for me it there was a time when it was enough to just be writing music. Like I think people's goals change because my goal when I was young was if I'm doing anything music relating related and getting paid for it, that's enough for me, you know, and now over time, it's sort of, I find my goals get more and more narrow and now it's becoming really important to me. The idea of having my own, my own, you know, autonomy and being able to have my own clients. I I really love YouTube for that reason too. Like you pointed out, it's it feels like mine, and yeah. I feel like I have control over that. And I I actually enjoy that aspect with clients too. To an extent, is it's nice to be able to when you're the composer, you can yeah. establish so, at least some level of ground rules, boundaries. It's easier to communicate with people because you're not going through a middle person. Yeah, you know, so there's this aspects that I'm realizing are important to me that I, I didn't realize were before. Well, and there's also a personality difference, I think, between someone with an employee mindset and someone with an entrepreneur mindset, I think, because yeah, yeah. some people are employees, and I'm not saying this with any kind of, you know, um, degrading undertone or anything. Some people need the structure of having a boss, having a supervisor, having an office, that they have to go to having a salary and having that structured environment. Um, and I never loved being an employee. Like for the most part, I think I was a good employee, but you know, it, you're working for someone else. You're, yeah. Yeah. you're helping someone else run their business. It's not, you know, none of it is mine, as you were saying, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's like you're going constantly through middlemen and you're dependent on completely dependent on another person and their work and their clients and you have to do things the way they want them to be done and um and the know, way I, their clients want it to be done yeah so it's like a ladder yeah yeah well, but sometimes it was also just inefficiencies in their workflow and it would just crush me every sure. time like yeah. this is if if i find myself thinking every day this is not how i would do this then clearly at some point i need to go out there and do it the way i would do it <laughs> yeah yeah that's a really good point though because you're right I, I think i think you're right there are people who who really thrive off of that structure and uh yeah i think that that's something that's tough more difficult for me because you have i you have ideas on how you'd run things and also i i just for me as much as i love writing music i also really enjoy the business aspect of this job and and I guess the entrepreneurial aspect it's really fun to build something from the ground up it's fun to be able to educate people or educate a team and and help yeah. each other grow I, I think that that's something that I really gravitate towards that level of autonomy and yeah yeah it's just it's an interesting point I didn't consider that yeah it depends on the person and their needs it's, you know it, it's the freedom, you know, like, yeah, it, it's, it can be a blessing and a curse because with the freedom, obviously, obviously, initially comes financial insecurity. You of take course, all, yeah. all the risk is on you now, not mm -hmm. on someone else. You can't hide behind anybody. Um, and, you know, you have to have the self-discipline to, you know, do the thing. Of course, yeah. Um, which isn't always easy because there's <laughs> nobody there forcing you to do anything. You right. Know? It's like, if I don't want to work today, I'm not going to work today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But also having that freedom, because I was in really intense assistance situations as well, where I would work seven days a week, uh, 16 hour days. It was basically like I would get Oof. up in the morning, I would get in the car, drive to the studio. I would be in that dark room all day. Um, and then sometime late evening, I would get out of there um, sometimes too exhausted to even eat dinner and then just go home, sleep for as many hours as I could, get up again in the morning, drive to that office. It, it was just like that, <sighs> like that movie where every day happens the it's same. Groundhog Day, no, yeah. 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 And, you know, it just grinds away at you over and over. Yeah. And 
you know, it's, it's not, you know, some people have this romanticized idea of that, but at the end of the day, it feels like any other like cubicle job just mm -hmm. with some creative elements. But, yeah, that's exactly yeah, so it. Crushing. And oh my gosh, I tell my, I, some of the students I talk to, I'm like, be really careful what you think you're willing to do or say yes to, or how badly you want it. Like, don't, don't want it too much because if you want it too much, you're going to compromise yourself in the process. And, and it's just such a sad idea that some people would probably, I mean, it's a, you survived and that's, a, that's amazing <laughs> that you've, you've gotten through it. And, and on top of that, you've seen thing, you know, ways that you would do things differently, running your own business. I, that's amazing. But there's probably a lot of also, you know, a lot of people who go through that process and are like, I'm done. I, I don't oh, ever yeah. want to do this again. I'm, I'm getting something else. People, people burn out in those environments. Sometimes it's the lead composer's fault. Sometimes it's the production's fault. I mean, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day whose fault it is. Yeah. But people really burn out in those dark, lonely rooms. And, you know, after a couple of years, yeah, some people turn away from it or get depressed and just are like, I can't do this anymore. And then other people like me are like, is this the best way of doing things? Yeah. Maybe I should run my own business and make my own schedule and have a little more balance in my life. Yeah. Yeah. But and it sounds like you also trusted. I don't know if it came from a place where you just more wanting to get away from something or or just trusting yourself enough to do it. I mean, was it easy for you to make the decision? I know you said it kind of got laid out in front of you gradually, but was there ever um, doubt or was it kind of like, Oh yeah, there yeah. was a lot of doubt. Cause I thought a couple of years ago, there was still this um, predominant idea that if you ever want to get anywhere in this career, you have to assist someone and then they will eventually, you know, hand you your career. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember in 2016, I think it was, I did my internship at remote control productions and oh, I was I didn't realize desperate. you worked there. Yeah. I was, yeah, that was like, I was already mid career at that point, but I was like, you know, waiting for immigration stuff and I was mm -hmm. like, well, might as well do an unpaid internship. Um, <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? Well, otherwise I'd be sitting at home. So might as well yeah. just make connections there, see sure. if anybody wants to hire me. And I was dead set at that point still to be someone's assistant because I thought that's the only way. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the landscape of the entire industry has changed so much over those years. But I remember my exit interview with the intern manager at the time. And I kept telling him, like, I want you to give my resume to other people. I want to be hired here. I want to, you know, work for someone. I think that's the only way. I still wanted that, you know, regulated income. And, yeah, you know, right. And then, and he told me, he was like, you already have so much going on. You've done so much. You should not, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, you should, first of all, not, he already asked that in the initial interview. He was like, what are you doing here? You already mm. did like additional music on network TV shows. Why, why are you here? Yeah. Um, doing an unpaid internship. But so during the exit interview, he was like, you don't belong here. You have to go. You have to go do your own thing. And I didn't see it at the time. And then I remember, yeah. I remember a week later, um, they called me like another composer called from remote control asking me if I wanted to do another unpaid internship for them. And I said no. Mm. And that I think was the first time I ever turned anything down. And I was like, yeah. I, I guess I just made that choice. <laughs> <laughs> right. What have I done? Because <laughs> I yeah. started imagining myself in those rooms again, you know, because obviously you get to see what people do there. And I had already done all of that. As yeah. as I had done doing stem printing and cue conforming and music editing and session prep, all that stuff they were doing, I had already done. Mm -hmm. I was like, just really imagine yourself again in those rooms for 16 hours. Yeah. Seven days a week. Just imagine it and really think about whether that's where you want to go back to or whether that's just some romanticized idea that you have mm -hmm. about what that job is. And something can look so good on paper and feel so wrong. And that's, that's, yeah. I've, the best decisions I've made or the worst have been relative to whether or not I trusted my gut. And, and whether or not I rationalize my way into or out of something, at, at least in my experience, that it's 
the the ones and then you kick yourself so much harder too if you don't trust your gut because then you knew so you're like something was telling me did not do this and i did it then you're even more upset about the situation but yeah i've been in similar ones where i've gotten uh i remember i got a phone call from um a composer who i'd followed for a really long time and like just had done my legwork to stay in touch and and keep connections and went out and then sure enough like a year and a half later i got a phone call asking if i wanted to be like a full-time assistant there and i always thought i would say yes to it but when he asked me <laughs> i knew i was gonna say no yeah. it was just like a weird feeling i'm like oh my god what am i doing but yeah when I've, I've done that before where i didn't listen to my gut feeling you know where i didn't really think it through and just gave the answer that i thought was required Mm-hmm. And then I would find myself in a job and just going, why did I say yes to this? This is awful. I yeah. shouldn't be here. Like, it doesn't why take long here? to realize it either, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like that like... sinking feeling while you're yeah. on the job, just going, oh, no, yep. now yep. I have to do this. <laughs> I read in a, a book called Essentialism, and he was uh, the author was saying that if it's not like a hell yeah, that it should just be a no. And that's yeah. like been I'm not very good at that. But that's been a really good frame of reference that because you know when something's like, there's no question that I will do this versus yeah. something that's like, ah, you know, I guess I could make that work and, you know, start yeah. figuring out how to fit it into the schedule and how to save that person. And yeah, yeah, it's an interesting one. Yeah, I love that we have like the same, the, I guess I could make that work, question well, yeah, mark, because yeah, I yeah, shouldn't it's like say helping. no. Yeah, <laughs> it's very, I, I've, I like to, it feels good to help people. You know, so I, I think that to an extent, it's like, I mean, and we are in jobs of in somewhat of service to people in some ways. So that mindset of of helping people, I think, is probably natural to the job, but yeah. not at the expense of one's own, you know, sanity. Yeah, but also this idea. I mean, I don't when I started here, there was also this prevalent idea that you should always say yes to everything. You know, especially at the beginning of your career, you need to say yes all the time, take everything, do everything, be yeah. accommodating, you know, because you should be grateful you even just are asked in the <laughs> You're first You're doing place. music for a living, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that's also a very good path to burnout, um, <laughs> first of all. But also, you know, over the past year or so, I have started saying no to things slowly and have started to be like, you know, do I want to do that? Probably not. And just kind of stepped away from certain things. And the funny thing is, the more I tried to get certain things, the more elusive they were apparently. Mm. And then the moment I step away and I'm like, you know what, I don't have to do that. I don't, I'm not doing that anymore. Those things are starting to come to me now. Like people Mm. are calling me and are like, hey, we haven't heard from you in a while. What about you? Do you want to do this? And I'm like, yeah. Oh, all this energy I put into trying to get this thing two years ago and you know now they're calling and they're like yeah and we'd love to offer you more money for it as well and i'm like oh okay yeah it's a strange it is a really strange thing i I find that to an extent too (laughs) i try to push things out i'm like sorry i don't you know i'm trying to ease out assistant work and they're like i'll pay you three times as much i know you're like wait what i could have gotten that (laughs) i still had people reach out in 2018 and 2019 going hey we need you for this and that and i'm like oh i don't really do that anymore and they offered me like five times what they had yeah. been paying me before and i'm like you could have I, paid me that <laughs> i guess it's just that you see you become aware of the true value that that you provide to somebody i mean it's a compliment in a in a way but <laughs> it's like oh i see <laughs> now i see you really do want to work with me but something my agent always says, she's like, she always asks me when she's negotiating for me, she always asks me, are you willing to walk away from this? Because that determines how harshly she's going to negotiate, mm. um, you know, and how much, yeah. you know, how far she's willing to go. So she always asks me, how far are you willing to go? Are you willing to turn your back on this gig? And yeah. sometimes I say no, and then she's going to be careful how she negotiates because, you know, we don't want the client to leave. Right. But in some uh, instances, I'm like, yeah, I'm OK not having that gig if they don't want to, you know, accommodate me in this way. Yeah. Um, and then very often, you know, she gets to negotiate in a way that normally she wouldn't. And then, you know, all of a sudden they do have more money and they do have more time and they can stretch the schedule. And I'm like, oh, yeah, 
Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time because I know we went a little bit over, but I, I really enjoyed chatting with you, Anne. This is awesome. Yeah. This is really Same. cool to talk about different subjects. I think people will find this stuff really interesting and useful too. So also, by the way, on a total side note, I'm a huge like coffee aficionado too. And I saw that you're into oh, coffee. Have you ever I gotten do. into home roasting? I have. Yes, yeah. I have a little roaster actually. It just always sets off the fire alarm. <laughs> like one time I actually set off the entire building alarm. <laughs> So, oh really <laughs> i was trying to do a dark roast <laughs> <laughs> came out like carbonized roast yeah pretty much <laughs>